Thank you. Uh, so welcome, welcome, thanks for uh, coming to this session. Uh, my name is Chris Madden, I work at, at NetApp, uh, and I work in a team that looks at third platform technologies and how, uh, yeah, how to adopt them in the field. Uh, now NetApp does data management, uh, I will use NetApp at moments in this presentation, but you don't need to use NetApp to do what we're going to cover today. So I just want to, to say that. Uh, so the topic of our, of our talk is, uh, is about containerizing stateful apps, some of the concerns you have, how to do it, and, uh, and then some examples. We'll have a couple of live demos as well. So what we'll do is we'll first talk a little bit about what is a stateful app, what kinds of data we have. We'll cover a little bit of the storage fundamentals of Kubernetes. Do people know uh, Kubernetes quite well in the room, or is it still something new? Can you raise your hand if Kubernetes is something you use daily? Can you raise your hand if you've never used Kubernetes? Okay. I know there were some sessions earlier today as well, and we just had one Kubernetes, and after me is Kubernetes. So uh, I may try to mention a couple of, uh, of core concepts maybe in the demo just to make sure that, it, uh, uh, you, that you can follow along uh, properly. So we'll look at some of the fundamentals, then we'll have a demo. Uh, of a, a state flaps, and then we'll look at, okay, what's the next step if we actually want to do a scale-out state flaps? How do we do those, and a demo of that as well. And we'll try to do that in a half hour. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that I, uh, that I, I, I like to, to talk about is when you talk about application data, you really have kind of two kinds. You have structured, semi-structured data, and, and these days we, we tend to use databases that are listed here. Right? And there are new ones coming about, uh, it seems like every month, right? that are more purpose-built and more specialized. And on the other hand, we have unstructured data. And I'd say unstructured data is really going more and more towards using object store as a location. But this is kind of where our data is going to sit. So if we start thinking about containers then, what kind of containers do we have and where is their data going to sit? So if we start, of course, we have stateless containers. And you know, we, what we just saw on the stage from Casey right, showed a couple of stateless containers. Right? There were no volumes there. It was simply a web service that was consulting a, um, you know, a back-end service to, 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 to do the prediction for us. You know, so your, your stateless service is, is written in some programming language that you have, uh, you have chosen. So that's the best case. You have no data to store at all. The data is going to be in some other location. Uh, in order to get that data, you do have to, to oftentimes talk to, to that system. Now, that could be object storage, as I say, maybe an S3 endpoint uh, at a hyperscaler or on your own uh, object store. Or it might be a cloud database, something where, where the, the, the database, you're just going to fully let someone else manage that for you, and you're just going to run queries against it. So that's kind of, let's say, the first option for if you do want to maintain state, but you don't want to do it in your container. If you do want to maintain state in your container, and you're going to run basically databases in containers, that's the next place you're going to put it. And you can see the stateless container now is basically storing its data in the stateful container. And the stateful container, of course, is, is running one of those databases I showed you, and it actually needs to store the data on some kind of, of physical media, right? Some kind of drive. And that could be direct attached storage, it could be a NAS system, a SAN system, it could be some cloud storage, an EBS volume for example. And I'd say these are the two main uh, uh, ways that you should go about architecting your apps. You may, however, also have this third line here, where you have some apps that are actually stateless, but you know, gosh, they, they actually need a little bit of storage for something. And you, you can do that as well. I would say that's not a design pattern you should, uh, you should go for, but if it happens, uh, uh, you may also have those containers accessing the storage directly. So why do you want to put some of your, your, your containers that need state in containers in the first place. Uh, I'd say, you know, going with the themes of the conference about scaling easier and, 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 and doing it reliably, uh, scaling is simply easier. You can scale this up very, very quickly. Um, and you also can scale up without scaling the, the, the manpower you need to manage it, right? Because a container is very easy to create additional replicas. It's a lot less work. And from a reliability perspective, all of your configuration is defined in those, those YAML files like we just saw, and we'll see more of them later. What that means is that it's repeatable. You can roll out new uh, stateful containers right, that host these databases uh, easy. You can, you can put that into your uh, source code management system like Git uh, so that you, you always know the situation uh, is, is as you think it is. And lastly, you can also kind of leverage the container platform, uh, Kubernetes, to do some of the extra work for you. 
right? Kubernetes has natively the ability to monitor, right? Readiness, text, readiness tests, liveness tests. So it can, it can help you basically manage that database environment that you would otherwise have to look at even more tooling to manage. Again, makes it easier, more reliable. And there's a but. And I will say, in contradiction to the session title, there are some stateful databases that you simply do not want to put in containers today. It's just more trouble than it's worth. So I'd say when you're going down this path, you probably, if, if you encounter one of these, you will bang your head against the table enough and realize, you know, this is one that's better for me to leave until, uh, until another day, until some of the tooling and the infrastructure is a little bit more mature. Uh, so just want to also uh, make that uh, caveat. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's go and, and look at how does Kubernetes do storage. So the first thing that Kubernetes has is something called a volume. And a volume and a volume plugin. A volume plugin basically tells Kubernetes how to attach to a given type of volume. So if you look here at these volume plugins, there are many of them. I think there are 20, 30 of them uh, these days. Uh, and, and some of them you see are the cloud providers, you know, NFS, uh, iSCSI, some of the, the ones you might be more familiar with on-premise. And uh, you can see over here a pod. So a pod is a, uh, a namespace. It has one or more containers in it that are all going to be located on a single node. It's kind of one of the requirements or one of the ways that Kubernetes works. So what you can see here is there's kind of an association from this pod has a volume, and that volume is mapping directly to this NFS volume. And when I say mapping directly, I mean really, really directly. So this is a, 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 some YAML. So this is the, the configuration of a pod that's using a native volume uh, from Kubernetes. And you can see here at the bottom, when he's using his volume, he explicitly states the endpoint he's talking to, the LUN ID he's talking to, very, very specific things, all embedded right in the pod manifest. Now, do you think that's a good thing? Anybody? Is it a good thing, bad thing? It's, it's okay. Maybe at small scale, it's okay. But if you, it, the idea here, right, is to abstract the, the configuration from the infrastructure. I would love to be able to create this pod that needs some storage and run it on-premise today and in a Google Cloud Platform tomorrow, right? Or, or run a few of them in each. Well, if you have this kind of stuff here at the bottom, you can't do that. So I'd say volumes are really the very first integration, the very the most uh, uh, simplistic integration. I will say, though, this is still quite advanced. If you look at what, what Docker provides natively, for example, it's, it's not nearly as sophisticated as this. This also gives Kubernetes the, the knowledge and the know-how on how to connect to different volume types. So again, if I had a Ceph RDB, for example, then Kubernetes knows how to connect to it and disconnect to it. It already speaks that. So as you get more, uh, let's say, um, yeah, not proprietary, but uh, yeah, uh, not standard protocols, uh, this allows you to access them. So Kubernetes saw this as being a limitation. You want to abstract things. That's one of the goals. Uh, so then they created the concept of a persistent volume. So a persistent volume is now a piece of networked storage. So a volume could also be a local storage, could be a local directory. Persistent volume is, is always going to be an, a piece of network storage. And it's a, a first-class resource in the cluster. So what that means is just like the cluster administrator would add nodes to the cluster, like we saw Casey a moment ago, I think he added five nodes into his Kubernetes cluster. You also add storage resources into your cluster or persistent volumes into your cluster. That persistent volume, again, uses a given volume type so that Kubernetes knows how to talk to that NFS or iSCSI or Google Cloud uh, storage. These things can be provisioned statically or dynamically, and they have a, you know, capacity, access mode, some other attributes to them. Now, this is the resource. So just like you have a node that you would create in your cluster, right, that has CPU and memory in it, a persistent volume also has you know, capacity and some of these uh, labels associated with it. So here's an example of a persistent volume that you could create. And now you see in here we have the connection details of this NFS mount, but it's being kind of wrapped within this persistent volume. Now, the persistent volume is, is, is now uh, imported, let's say known by Kubernetes. Now, how do you make use of that, that resource? Well, you do something called a, a request a persistent volume claim, or a PVC. And a PVC is what you then request in your application. So your user says, I want some storage, and I'm now I'm going to give how big it should be. Maybe I'm going to give some tags about it. 
I'm going to give a storage class for it, and that's it. What the actual volume I get is, is not something that uh, I specify. Because again, I'm trying to abstract my user request from the implementation on the system. So here's an example kind of combining those the, the persistent volume claim with using it. So what the user would then do if he wanted to, to start up a, a pod, so here on the right-hand side, you can see this, this user wanted to start an Nginx pod, so he wanted a, a web server container, basically, and he wanted to, to map some volume into it. And you can see here at the bottom here, in the, uh, what's shown as second step there, you can say it asked for a volume named myvol, and it uses a, a claim name of pvc5 gig. So that's specifically saying I want a specific claim that I've already created. That's why in the first step over here, I created that claim. So you can kind of follow. The user wanted to, to go ahead and get some, some persistent storage for his application. He created a claim, which just set a capacity and type of storage. And then he actually used that claim in his pod. Now, if you have a claim, how does the claim actually get matched up to the actual physical volume on the system? Right, or the persistent volume on the system. So if you, if you think about how Kubernetes does it when it has a pod, the, the Kubernetes scheduler will look for a pod, look for nodes that are available in the cluster, and then do bin packing. Basically put that pod in the most intelligent place or the place that the scheduler thinks is the best place for that pod. That's basically the same thing that's going to happen with a persistent volume. He's going to look for an, an appropriate persistent volume. Now that persistent volume had, could have gotten there in two ways. It can either be static, which means it has to be pre-created, or it can be dynamic where it's uh, created on demand. So let's look at a static example. Um, so here we have on the left, we have a user, and on the right, we have the, the uh, administrator. In the middle, we have Kubernetes. So if, if the, the, in a static environment, the, the cluster administrator would need to go out to his storage system or his uh, storage, uh, software-defined storage, whatever it is, and he would need to create a couple of volumes on that and map those over to the nodes that are in the cluster. That's what he did here, and then he added them into the cluster as, as persistent volumes. Then the user would come along, he would make a request uh, for some persistent volume claims uh, on, on his pods, and then the persistent volume controller would basically see this and marry them up. Now, if you look here, there are kind of two problems with this, this way of working. One is that that administrator had to do something. So as we start to scale and getting hundreds or thousands of these volumes, we don't want an administrator manually managing all these uh, physical volumes, these persistent volumes. And then secondly, he does a, a best fit. And a best fit means that this, the volume needs to be equal or greater in size. So you'll see that in one of these cases, he actually mapped an 8 gigabyte request over to a 10 gigabyte volume. Right? That's not very efficient. That's wasted capacity. So static provisioning is something that, again, you, you can do to get started, but probably long term is not uh, a good approach for you. That's why Kubernetes developed this concept of dynamic provisioning. Now, with dynamic provisioning, it, it implemented something called storage classes. And a storage class allows the Kubernetes administrator to, to basically abstract his backend storage resources behind this class. And then users consume the class. Again, we're getting more abstraction. So if you can imagine this, then I could have a gold class of storage that was my on-premise that maybe had NetApp storage, and I could have a gold class of storage in Google Cloud that equated to, to a, a high IOP level volume on their platform. Right? So it gives me that abstraction. Here's an example of creating a storage class. You can create as many of these as you want. This one's using the, the NetApp uh, provisioner, and you can see there are some parameter types that are being passed, and it's creating a, uh, a storage class called gold. So let's see the dynamic provisioning, how this model works. So here, again, I have my user and my cluster administrator. What he's going to do first is he needs to install the provisioner. There are some provisioners that are mainline Kubernetes. You don't have to install, but you will have to configure something, some credentials, endpoints. Uh, in our case, we, we have one that you need to install. Uh, you also need some, some kind of storage system. In this case, the, the administrator has defined some quality of service uh, bands. Uh, on the storage system. So he's basically defined a gold, a silver, and a bronze that have a min, max, and a burst I.O. level. So this allows us to do a lot of consolidation of services and ensure performance for our containers. So he's done this kind of as a, a one-time action. Then he goes away and he you know, gets, to go, uh, gets to go party. Because the users and developers, they're going to keep working. 
And when they work, they create something like a, a, a claim. They say they want eight gigs of gold storage. What's going to happen is Trident or the dynamic provisioner is going to actually see that this request is pending and go ahead and create the storage. Once it's created the storage, then the controller from Kubernetes is going to match them up. So I mentioned this, this thing called Trident. Um, this is a specific piece of software from NetApp. It's open source with an Apache 2 license. And it basically allows any NetApp storage type to be connected uh, via Ethernet to your Kubernetes cluster. So if you already have NetApp storage or you're looking for an on-premise on solution, uh, this is something that will allow you to, to get dynamic storage management in a Kubernetes environment. Now, it's not only with NetApp that has these provisioners. Here's actually a variety of other provisioners, dynamic provisioners that are available. You'll see the hyperscalers are in there, as well as some other open source offerings. And there are a few more out there. So what I'm going to show you here could also be done with other tech sets. So let's go ahead and have a demo. Uh, so I thought for a, for a demo, I, I'd pick a nice, easy, stateful app, right? MySQL, just a single database. WordPress needs some, not some area to save its you know, images and things that are not in the database. And my ping is still looking good, so let's, let's give it a try here. Is this uh, readable, or do I need to go even bigger? Put your hand up if I need to go bigger. I'll go one bigger. I don't, I'm afraid things will start to wrap if I go too much. Where is it here? Terminal zoom. Uh, so what I've done here, again, our goal here is to, uh, so first I just thought I would show a little of what the environment looks like. So I ran a couple of commands here. You can see them here. Uh, basically looked at the nodes I have. So you can see I have a three-node cluster. It's running 164. That's the latest and greatest Kubernetes version. You can see the storage classes I've already created. So I created a, bon a bronze, gold, silver, silver shared. Create as many as you want. The first three there all equate to a, a solid fire system that we have. So it's an, a NetApp system that does iSCSI. And the shared one is actually doing NFS. So if you wanted to share data across multiple pods, uh, you, this would be a, an option you could use. And then at the bottom there, you'll see the get PV is showing the physical vol persistent volumes I have. Now Trident, our provisioner, also maintains state in an etcd database, and that's on that volume. So we have no other uh, user uh, volumes yet. So let's go ahead then and look at our, our, our YAML file. So to create our MySQL database and our WordPress front end, uh, the first thing we're going to do is have some persistent volume claims. Again, this is the request for storage. So I can see here that I'm going to request a, uh, some gold storage here. I'm going to call it MySQL disk, size of 50 gigs. I have another one here that I'm going to request called silver shared type of storage at 5 gigs. So these are going to be my storage resources underneath WordPress and SQL Server. The next thing you can see here is I'm actually going to create my pod definition. So in my pod here, I'm going to add a MySQL Server. You can see I'm giving him just a half CPU. I'm going to run MySQL 5.6 and uh, export some points, e export some ports. And you can also see here that there's a volume. So here's where I'm actually making use of the volume. So I have a I have a volume here, a persistent claim that's called MySQL disk. That's the one we just created at the top of this file. And I'm going to give that a, this name here. And then you'll see this name here I'm actually using into a mount. So what this, this little area here, this snippet, is going to cause me to do is that that disk that's being mounted into the, into the pod is going to become available at var lib MySQL. And essentially doing something similar uh, for the front end WordPress system. So now let's go ahead and see right now we don't have any resources. So right now we haven't created any pods. We haven't created any physical volume, uh, persistent volume claims. So let's go ahead and uh, create our WordPress. So what this is going to do is it's going to create a bunch of resources. So it's going to create those claims. It's going to create our pods for MySQL and WordPress, and then some services in front of them so that we can reach them. So that's going to take a minute to, to run. So I th what I thought first is we just have a, a, a quick look here at, at what happened. So this persistent volume claim list here, you can see here, this is actually the two requests, and you can see their status is now bound. 
So that means the dynamic, dynamic provisioner saw that there was a request, went ahead and provisioned the storage and mapped it up. I can see the storage classes that are mapped to it, right? It happened 15 seconds ago. If I go and look at one of the underlying persistent volumes, I can then see that, oh, in fact, one of them was an iSCSI disk at this exact endpoint on this LUN ID with this file system type. What's interesting to note is that if I'm a user, I only get to see the volume claim. I don't get to see the volume. Again, that's the abstraction. Why does the user need to know the details of the iSCSI endpoint? It's, it's, it's not, not relevant for him or her. All right. So let's just go ahead and see if things have been created yet. Oh, actually, everything is already created. So these were my two pods. Uh, it already went through the, the pulling of the container and the running of it. It's now up and running. It's been up for a minute. I can see that the SQL and the WordPress are actually running on different nodes. Let's go ahead and find the port that this is running on. So this system here is uh, exporting it on this port. And if I come into my GUI, I should see that there is a WordPress site now available on this port. Now, if I had Load Balancer, like Casey showed, he had Load Balancer, and on Google Cloud, then he had a, a Load Balancer created, and he could access it from the internet. As Kubernetes standard on-premises, you, you can't do that. That's not a feature function. You need to, to use Nginx or HAProxy or something else in, in front of it. Um, so I just mapped it through on a, on a, on, on a, on a hard-coded port. Uh, you'll see that WordPress is active. So basically, that this installation worked. I just spun up two stateful containers, and I have my stateful app that's, uh, that's, that's, that's able to save data away. Could also be interesting if I look on the, on the storage system, just out of curiosity, I can also see that the storage has been provisioned over there, and I can see the, the, the volumes that are active. Now, one of the volumes I created was an NFS uh, data volume type. The other was an iSCSI. Here's actually the one that got created you know, at 1457 two minutes ago. So it really gives a nice integration. If I were to delete that pod, that would delete the volume claim, or if I were to delete the volume claim, rather, that would also delete the persistent volume underneath. So it kind of cleans up after you. So if you have a dynamic environment where you're creating a lot of projects and then deleting projects, this also ensures that you don't have orphan storage that you're, uh, that you're going to be maintaining and, and, and paying for. OK. So So that's all fine. For, for, for something that there's a, basically a replica count of one, what I just showed you is enough. Um, what if you have databases that need to scale out a little bit bigger, right? You want to use, um, yeah, you, you, want, you, you want to kind of manage a scale out database. Uh, this is where Kubernetes came out with the concept called stateful sets. This was originally called pet sets, then it was renamed to stateful sets. It's still a beta feature. It's not yet uh, uh, reached production uh, quality level. Uh, what a stateful set does is provide some additional constructs. Uh, the first one is it gives a stable network identifier to your pods. So what that means is if you were to run like host name inside the pod, it would have a predictable name. So a lot of, sta a lot of databases that are scale out like to have fixed names so that all the nodes know who's, who's a member and, and, and have a name. This gives it to you. You can also see what it does is it puts the name, dash, and index. The index starts at zero and it increments. So as you create more replicas, it simply goes up. It also gives you uh, a guarantee that the scheduling of these pods will be in order. So in other words, that pod zero, ordinal index zero, will, will come, must pass its readiness test before it will start the next ordinal index. So that makes sure that, that you're adding these in a way that you're not going to hit a race condition where uh, some services aren't ready yet. Uh, and it also uh, allows you to take a persistent volume claim and actually embed that into the stateful set definition. This is all great, but then again, there's a but. And, and the but here is you probably need more. So once you start doing this, you're going to think about, OK, at my database level, how are, how are all of these different nodes going to join each other? How am I going to do rebalancing or resharding? What, what happens if, if a node fails? Maybe I have a, 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 a writable node and the rest are read replicas. And the, and the writable node fails. How do I going to promote one of those read nodes to be a write node? All these kinds of things are, are today not something that stateful sets handles. Maybe the biggest one uh, could be upgrading. So there's no way to, to, to upgrade your image today to, 
for example, a newer version of your database. It's not supported by stateful sets today. So what we see is kind of there are two design patterns. And uh, the first design pattern we see to kind of overcome this is something called maybe a bot or a sidecar pattern. And what that is is you, you basically put a, uh, another container or process uh, alongside your database in the same pod. And this one is basically responsible for kind of looping and discovering, reaching consensus with the other, other uh, instances of the database and kind of doing the right thing. So he would detect if a pod went down, decide with all of the other pods, yes, our writable pod went down. OK, I want to promote one of the read-only replicas to be a writable node. That kind of activity is now happening in logic that you've written and kind of put in uh, right alongside your, your database itself. And there are a few examples of these. You know, just go out and, and, and Google, and, and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find uh, read more about these two. The second design pattern we see that kind of late last year started becoming popular and I think is the one that may have a, a longer legs, maybe a, an, in the future one that gets even more popularity, is to use something called an operator. Uh, so an operator is actually uh, using a third-party resource mechanism to create a new resource type in Kubernetes. So instead of having like a stateful set as a resource type, you can now have a etcd type. And then in that type, you can have different properties. Right, like the number of replicas you have, but now it's etcd replicas. And then th that logic is, it, of the third-party resource is basically going to manage it for you. So you're going to make changes within your definition of that, um, that operator, and it's going to go out and actually impact the environment and, and scale it in a, in a safe way. OK, so if we go back to stateful sets, uh, if you're going to use them, there's because I, I will say on this last one, if you're using one of these, either you have to find someone else that's done the work or you have to go do it, right? It's, it's not trivial here. Depending on how complicated the database is, you have to, you, you have to yeah, basically integrate the database uh, with Kubernetes so that they're, they're yeah, in sync. Uh, if we go back to just stateful sets, so of, of, uh, uh, there are kind of three main components you're going to use. Uh, one of them is called a headless service. This basically allows all of the uh, pods within your stateful set to communicate with each other. They don't need to communicate outside, but they need to. This gives them a reachability uh, to each other on a, on a fixed name. Uh, you have the, the stateful set itself, where you're going to say the number of replicas, and then you have a claim template. So I will give a quick demo here now with uh, MongoDB. Uh, and in the sake of time, I'm actually not going to look at the YAML file. Um, but we'll go ahead and first just check if there's anything out there. No, right now there are no resources, so we're all cleaned up. Uh, oops, I need one. So let's go ahead and create our MongoDB. So this is the command that I ran. You can see I created uh, using this YAML file, and he went out and created a, a, a service and a stateful set, and if I then go and I watch the resources that it created, I can see what I, what I mentioned a moment ago. You see how it says Mongo zero, right? That's the name of my stateful set and the, and the cardinal index starts at zero. And you can see the, the process right now is container creating. So he's pulling it down. Oh, you can see it finished already. The readiness test must have passed. And he went ahead and started creating now Mongo dash one. I asked for a database size of three, so this will go on for a few more times. You'll also see that it's, it's actually creating the persistent volume claim at the bottom as it's starting the container, right? So right now I have two claims at the bottom that are bound to my storage. Again, the persistent dynamic provisioning is doing that. Oh, here's the third one going now. It's pending, also creating the container. You can see that they're, they're distributed on different nodes. And he's, uh, he's kind of you know, working along here. This one will be up, uh, up shortly. Well, I don't quite want to scale it until it's all the way up. So let's just make sure that all three are up. Uh, and then I'll show you how I could scale this. So maybe, OK, now I have all three that are up. Let's decide that we wanted to scale this higher. So here's just a simple command. I'm saying I want to scale this now to five replicas. And if I go and watch the resources, we basically see it just keeps on moving, right? So I've now adapted it from three to five. I can see now the Mongo 3, so ordinal 4 is being created or the fourth in, my, uh, in my, my stateful set is being created. Again, at the bottom here, even more storage is getting allocated. 
if I were to check across over in my uh, storage, uh, storage GUI to look at what storage resources have been created, I can see the list is getting longer, right? Because each of these is, is creating another volume dynamically for me. So this last one is, uh, is creating, but we don't need to wait for it. What I thought I would show you then is you can also go ahead and look at the logs of a cluster. So this is actually just connecting to one of the nodes and looking at the logs. And I can see here on that you know, there are 11 connections active. So basically all of the, all of the nodes are talking to each other and uh, yeah, staying in sync. And I can verify that this is, this is happening as expected. Okay, so I, I wanted to show you these kind of two examples, one of a very simple example with dynamic provisioning and one with a more complicated example. Um, I guess my, my key takeaway is that Kubernetes has a very advanced storage uh, infrastructure in it, connects to a wide variety of volume types, and can integrate storage to basically make, remove storage management from the puzzle, just to make it autonomous. It's a first-class object in Kubernetes, and it's really quite sophisticated. For more information, you can check the, uh, the, the Kubernetes uh, site. And also, if you're interested about any of the NetApp integration or NetApp work in open ecosystems, so this includes configuration management uh, software, uh, containers, a, a lot of things like that, you can also go to netapp.io. And with that, I want to thank you for, for coming. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. There is one. There is one. Uh, you were talking about uh, maybe doing some uh, storage on, on your own system and some in cloud. Um, how would you solve that with the dynamic provisioning? So, so, th so the question is, uh, if you want to do some storage on-premise and some storage in the cloud, how do you solve that? And, 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 and the answer is, if you're using storage classes, then the storage class definition for your Kubernetes cluster that's on site might use the NetApp provisioner in the back end. And the one that you have on a cloud provider might use the, the cloud provider's dynamic provisioner on the back end. So from a, uh, from a, a creation of your, your manifest perspective, it's identical. That manifest could be uh, uh, applied to, to the cloud instance or the on-premise instance, and both of them will, will work and provision storage. Now, if the goal is to replicate the storage or have the same storage or move a workload from one to the other, that's not something that is uh, possible today, not something that's built in Kubernetes today. You need other techniques to, to replicate the data between those uh, volumes. But it does give you the abstraction. And I think that's what's important. It allows you to, to deploy at either location without making any changes. Also, if there are other questions, I'll be at the NetApp stand uh, later on throughout the day, so you can find me there. Thanks. Thank you.